Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Trish Bender with Garden Club of South Carolina, and I'm really pleased to be bringing you a special presentation today that goes in line with our Garden for Life theme. As you know, the goal of Gardening for Life is to garden for maximizing life at all layers of your landscape by using sustainable methods, organic gardening, native plants, and edible and pollinator um, specific varieties. We wanna maximize density and maximize diversity. And with us today is a, a husband and wife team who are doing this already um, in Waynesville, North Carolina. Uh, Brandon Basham is a writer and horticulturist who lives in Waynesville, Western North Carolina. And together with his wife, Jill Jacobs, they own Sprigley's Beescaping, a small business focused on nature education and habitat restoration. Uh, Brandon presents workshops regularly throughout the area, particularly in the South Atlantic region. Um, and his focus is on wildlife, particularly pollinators, and gardening services that enhance um, the design and the implementation to maximize effectiveness. In addition, he's a weekly nature writer for the Silva Herald and also writes um, regularly for the Smoky Mountain Living Magazine. Um, at the very end of this presentation, um, you'll also see a link to his latest book um, called A Guide to the Wonderful World Around Us, Notes on Nature, which features 60 different articles across a variety of nature topics. Um, as you know, we've been talking about pollinator gardening, um, designing for pollinators and learning all about pollinators. And we've been doing that for about a year and a half now. And I know that you probably know so much about bees, um, native bees, honeybees, and butterflies. So I've asked um, Brannon to take us to the next level because, you know, bees and butterflies are just the tip of the iceberg. And there are so many more pollinators that you may not have even realized um, are working very hard to create your garden landscape. And Brandon is going to present those to us today. Um, again, if you have any questions, please add them to the chat room and we will try to adjust, uh, address them through the program and afterwards during the Q&A session. So Brandon, take it away. Welcome. Well, thank you for that great introduction. And thank you everyone for being here today, this afternoon. And thanks to the Garden Club of South Carolina for having us. Um, Yep, my name is Brandon Basham. Uh, I focus mostly on habitat restoration, mostly geared towards beneficial insects. But as I'm sure you've learned, the good thing about gardening for beneficial insects is you attract all wildlife by doing these same practices. And so today we're gonna learn about most of the underappreciated pollinators in and around your garden. Those would be wasps, flies, moths, beetles, and ants. I won't be talking about birds birds or bats today, excuse me, mostly focusing on insects, um, but you'll be fascinated uh, as far as the interconnected uh, roles that all of these insects really play in the ecosystems, again, in and around your garden. Um, and now to start things off, there are a few general rules of thumb to take into account when you're designing and planning your pollinator garden. And I'll just go over them quickly here now, but I'll also get into these more in depth later. So don't feel like you have to um, you know, write all these down immediately. But interestingly enough, one of the most important things you can do while you're gardening for wildlife is to actually do nothing at all. Um, interestingly enough, wild spaces, that is spaces that are allowed to regrow into a state that they would be naturally, are some of the most important things that you can have in and around your pollinator gardens. And now, when, I'm, when I say leave a space wild, I don't just mean let it go, even though that is the first great step, but while you're letting the grass grow without cutting, you're letting native plants that might be in the seed bank waiting their turn to come up, while you're letting those native plants emerge, you'll also just wanna to get to know the invasive plants in your area and you'll wanna start removing any invasive plants that you see in and around your property. 
Um, so first off, familiarize yourself with some of the key invasive plants in your area. Now, Asiatic bittersweet is one of the ones uh, that's pretty prevalent in this whole area. Russian olive and of course kudzu are some of the main red flags that you'll want to keep an eye out for. Those plants will do their best to kind of encroach and take over your pollinator plants in those first couple years when they're really getting themselves established. And so you do want to keep a close eye out for any invasives, especially in heavy developed areas. And now uh, wild spaces in a garden don't have to go necessarily in the middle of your beds. And now, as we see in this picture here, this is a pollinator garden that we designed and built last year. And you can see that even though it's a very manicured space with pathways and uh, very delineated bed spaces, there are also plenty of wild spaces off to the periphery. You can see to the right side, there's a slope that's mostly undisturbed. And also beyond the garden, there's also a very wide, almost meadow-like space that's all been left wild. And so I encourage you, if you don't you know, like the look of overgrown or quote unquote messy spaces, try to put these wild spaces in the corners or the periphery of your garden, maybe behind some taller plants. But as you're letting your native plants kind of regrow and retake over a wild space, you absolutely also want to leave any dead standing trees or dead wood that has fallen in that space as well. Interestingly enough, dead wood is a critical habitat for a wide range of bees, beetles, and even species like wasps, butterflies, and moss actually use the hollow insides of dead trees for shelter during the wintertime. And so it's very important to try and leave any natural detritus that's in that area as well. And now one other important thing to keep in mind when you're gardening for pollinators and wildlife is to try to leave some areas of the garden with sparse or no mulch at all. And now I do know it is anathema to most gardeners to not have uh, mulch basically covering every space of bare soil. And mulch certainly does a great job of keeping moisture levels at a good, uh, a good space in your garden uh, and also controlling weeds. But uh, heavy mulch can actually restrict access to the soil for a lot of our beneficial ground nesting insects, like beetles, wasps, and bees, and a lot of others as well. And so you can see in this picture on the right-hand side, in this garden, we also tried to leave areas of sparse or non-existent mulch to give those beneficial animals access to the soil. And now while I'm talking to, about soil, really let's talk about soil as the number one thing to look at when you're designing a garden. And now this is actually the space of that garden we were just looking at before it was developed or before it was built uh, as a garden. And now when we approached this space, it had actually been a completely cleared house site. And what normally happens um, in areas of heavy human disturbance or uh, disturbances like this is a developer will come and basically slough off all of the topsoil, leaving you with a very hard, poorly draining uh, clay crust, basically. And you're gonna wanna look at your soil and really determine if it's that hard clay or if any of that uh, topsoil has been left. Um, again, especially if you're in a heavily uh, you know, urbanized area, you're gonna find that most of your topsoil has been carted away to the highest bidder. And so unfortunately, the first thing you're gonna to have to do is amend your soil. So basically that means just mixing that clay with some other topsoil and or maybe mushroom compost or other well-draining soils to try and open up that soil, break up the clay a little bit and allow the plants that you plant to have an easier time stretching out their roots and getting uh, water, uh, air, and nutrients to their roots where they need it. Uh, and also something to keep in mind, if you do have a site like this, that's basically just a, a hard clay shell, you also will probably run into some drainage issues. And so take a close look at where the water's flowing on your property, where it's building up because um, this clay's lack of ability to drain, and you wanna control or channel that drainage into an acceptable space before you really start your garden. But again, a space as devoid of life like this, one year later, it was, it was bustling with life with hundreds of different species of native plants. And that's just how quickly the change like this can take place. And now 
One other very important thing to do while you're gardening for pollinators is try to leave any leaves that fall on your property where they are. Um, interestingly enough, a good deal of insects, especially moths and wasps and even bumblebee queens, actually use layers of leaf litter to insulate themselves during the winter time and actually survive until the next season. A lot of these insects actually pump a antifreeze type solution throughout their bodies to keep themselves from freezing. Um, but during that time, they do prefer about two inches at least of leaves to kind of burrow under. And so just like with leaving wild spaces in your garden, try to leave leaf piles, even in a, a very manicured space like this, in the corners of the property or somewhere where maybe it won't be as much of an eye catcher, but will still give the animals uh, in your area that, that critical winter habitat. Now, interestingly enough, um, studies have shown, I actually just read a paper a few weeks ago that found for whatever reason, ticks really like to multiply in leaf piles right on a woodland edge. And so the one thing to keep in mind with your leaves is try not to have them right on the edge of a woodland, either have them more into the, the yard clearing or further into the forest. But it seems that right on the woodland edge is not a great place to keep your leaf piles. Now, of course, stop using pesticides. I'll get into the effect of pesticides a little bit later. Um, but uh, reducing or removing the pesticide usage in the garden is one of the most important things you can do to really attract and foster populations of native insects. Um, the two last critical things are plant native plants whenever and wherever possible, and try to plant your plants in a way that something is always blooming during the growing season. And so that can really be accomplished with, with as little as three different species. So you want something that blooms in the spring, something that blooms in the summer, and something that blooms in the late summer into the fall. And that kind of keeps your space attractive for the entire growing season for a wide range of beneficial insects that might be stopping by and looking for forage. Now, of course, the best step for designing a space for an animal is getting to know that animal a little bit, getting to know how it lives its life and really what plants it prefers. And so today I'm gonna to be going through some of the most beneficial insects that usually kind of work right under our noses without um, any of our notice. And we'll go through their life cycles, kind of what they prefer and a lot of the fascinating aspects of a lot of these creatures. And so now we'll first start with wasps and now everyone stay in their seats. I know this picture usually encourages people to run at the first sight of these warning colorations and these groups of wasps. But wasps are actually incredibly important pollinators as well as very effective pest control. Just like bees, there's a very small percentage of wasps that are known as social. And that means they live together in a hive, they cooperate labor, and usually there's one or a few queens that kind of control the hive while the rest work for those uh, royalty. Now, interestingly enough, bees and wasps are very similar. Of course, the, really the main difference between the two is what they feed their young. Both bees and wasps feed their young protein in order to help them grow up, but wasps feed their young protein in the form of animal remains, whereas bees feed their young protein in the form of pollen. Now, interestingly enough, even though wasps eat meat and or animal protein uh, as their young forms, as adults, wasps actually feed on nectar um, as their food. And so wasps, adult wasps are constantly visiting flowers and they're constantly performing pretty adequate pollination as they're visiting those flowers for food throughout the day. Uh, but their pollination uh, pales into com in comparison to their pest control prowess. Now wasps are believed to account for about 50% of all insect on insect predation. So that means without wasps, the world would quickly be overrun by the sap suckers and munchers of the world. And we would um, basically be up to our knees in pest insects. And so wasps are incredibly important. And um, really the social wasps can be really viewed as almost functioning similar to birds in an ecosystem. These wasps will go out in the wild, they'll hunt their prey. Usually these social wasps are very generalist hunters. And so they'll hunt almost any pest that they'll see in your garden, mostly caterpillars or similar young larval forms of other insects. And they'll chew them up and they'll bring them back to their young and feed their young just like a bird would. Um, and while these, um, I would say these insects are more defensive and ornery than outright aggressive, 
we all know that they are, um, you know, very defensive, especially around their nests. And so while these insects are more docile than we give them credit for, of course, always keep uh, a wide berth from their nests. And if you do ever see a nest like this paper wasp nest um, in and around a space that re receives heavy human traffic, the best way to get rid of them actually is luck if you catch if you're lucky enough, excuse me, to catch it when the queen, the original occupant, is building her first combs, you can quickly scrape that comb down and replace it with a paper lunch bag filled with crumpled up newspaper. Put that crumpled up paper bag in the same spot where that nest was. And any wasps that come by usually will think that's another wasp nest and they actually won't build another nest there. And so I put those um, kind of trick um, nests up in heavy traffic areas, like say the front porch, where you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't want these stinging insects as close. However, for the vast majority of times, you can simply leave these insects alone and they'll never bother you. When they're out in the field, they're much more interested in getting a drink of nectar or hunting their favorite prey than really paying you any notice. So in general, wasps should not be feared. Now, while we just talked about the very small minority of social wasps, the vast majority of wasps, just like bees, are solitary. And what that means is they live alone. Basically, uh, the female does all the work herself and they don't cooperate, share labor, or have you know uh, paper hives or anything like that. Most wasps are what's known as parasitoids. And what a parasitoid is, is it's a parasite that feeds off of a host and it differs from a parasite in that a parasitoid always kills its host at some point during this process. And so the, wide, the vast majority of solitary wasps are specialized in feeding on only one or few types of prey that they instinctively know where they live and how to um, kind of inject eggs into their weak spots. And they actually use that prey as almost a mobile nest for those young as the young are growing. And then once the young mature, they usually burrow themselves outside of that, that host. And now, while a wasp like this might look very scary, this saber wasp, you can see it gets its name from that long protrusion off of the back of its abdomen. And while this looks like a stinger that could sting through, I mean, even the thickest of armor, that's not a stinger at all. It's actually an ovipositor. Actually, it's a more primitive form of a stinger in some ways because a stinger is actually an evolved ovipositor. And what that ovipositor does is it's just a tube used by the wasp to lay eggs. Now, a lot of solitary wasps like this that have those long ovipositors, they use those ovipositors to inject wood or inject eggs, excuse me, deep into wood where burrowing beetle larvae or other burrowing insects might be making shelter. And so they use that long ovipositor they actually use their antenna and specific acoustic devices on their bodies to listen into the wood. They can actually find, finely tune and find that prey underneath inches of wood. And they only have to stab that ovipositor into the wood once. Most of them can actually penetrate inches of wood and they can inject an egg directly into that prey uh, just through sound alone. And so uh, this gives an indication of just some of the incredibly complex um, interconnected um, kind of connections that these wasps have with a lot of their prey insects. And chances are uh, basically for each pest in your garden, there's probably at least one type of wasp that specializes in hunting just that pest. And so these are some of the most important pest control services you can have in your garden. And interestingly enough, the best way to attract these wasps in your garden is by leaving pests. Um, and so again, a lot of these wasps will fly through an ecosystem looking and listening for their favorite prey. And if they find them, they'll settle down in your area and start raising their young. And soon enough, you won't have to do a thing to control most of the pests in your garden. Now, the after effect of a lot of these wasps is this here, this poor saddleback moth uh, came into contact with the type of wasp that laid a ton of eggs inside of its body. Those larvae grew and then once they matured, those larvae actually burrow outside of the caterpillar and then pupate, um, you can see in these cocoons on the actual body of the caterpillar, 
still using those spines as kind of a defensive tactic against any predators. And then they'll emerge as fully grown adults from there going off to search for more caterpillars. So if you ever see a caterpillar uh, or any insect really that uh, has um, you know, cocoons or protrusions like this, chances are it's being attacked by those wasps. And now, interestingly enough, the, the rabbit hole that these wasps go down to, go through to reproduce, it, it's fascinating. For example, there are even hyperparasitoid wasps. And what those wasps do, like for example, a wasp might lay an egg on a leaf and that egg is counting on a caterpillar to eat that egg as the, as the caterpillar munches on the leaf. However, once the caterpillar injects that egg, that larva isn't looking to parasitize the caterpillar. It's actually looking for other parasites that are already in the caterpillar. And if those parasites are in inside that caterpillar, that wasp egg will then hatch, prey on those parasites, and then actually sometimes emerge without harming the host at all. And so again, just these wasps are so incredibly deeply entwined with their favorite prey that in many times they're relying on a, a very um, fragile series of events to take place for them to actually reproduce each year. And so again, the most important thing you can do to attract a lot of these important moths is have a, a good population of pest insects in and around your garden. And these wasps will move in on their own and provide services far more effective than anything you'll find at the end of a bottle. Now, some wasps, which are solitary, don't rely on other insects to kind of give their young nests. Some of our solitary wasps actually build nests of their own, just like this potter wasp. And you can see these potter wasps are solitary wasps as well. They are important pollinators, but they're incredibly effective at removing small caterpillars from the environment. Just like those uh, other um, solitary wasps I was talking about before, most potter wasps have very specific caterpillar prey that they've evolved to deal with and to hunt. And so many of these potter wasps will build those very intricate mud structures that can fit only one or two just enough prey that they can kind of cram into that space and then lay an egg on and then they'll seal it up and then those young will emerge the following year, year to continue <clears throat> uh, providing those great pest control services for your garden. Um, now interestingly enough, these potter wasps will also live in man-made housing for insects such as native wood nesting bees. And so um, sometimes you will see these wasps moving into those bee houses, but you don't have to worry. They'll never fight or uh, kill uh, any bees or anything like that. They actually coexist together very well. Um, uh, and the, the best way you can tell actually is these potter wasps are very careful about uh, carefully smoothing out the mud at the entrance to their nest. And so they, they have very smooth closures to that nest, uh, whereas most of our bees are much more sloppy and they kind of throw clumps of mud together. Um, and interestingly enough, I have heard stories that um, account that a lot of uh, early Native American pottery designs were actually based off of the designs that these potter wasps used to make their nest. And so if you ever do see these little beautiful, again, they look like pots almost, hanging out on the stems of plants or here, as you can see on a chain in a garden, or they'll even stick them on the side of a building. Um, but those again are, are very beneficial solitary wasps that are still hunting, you know, uh, caterpillars and sometimes spiders in your garden um, and providing you great pest control. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of the galls or kind of mutations on plants are also called caused by wasps as well. And so actually a lot of wasps um, are believed to inject either enzymes and or fungi into plants. And those uh, materials actually cause the plant to mutate and form these gall structures, which most of them are actually quite beautiful on the inside. And it's almost like a, a, a room on the inside, which is very spacious and gives those wasp young plenty of room to live inside and grow. And actually some of the galls that wasps make also create structures that those young wasps feed off of as they're growing in the gall. Um, you never have to worry about these galls damaging or spreading to your plants. They're really mostly only superficial. Um, 
And interestingly enough, after the wasps go ahead and emerge from uh, their gall, most of these wasps actually have special pockets built into their bodies that they will scoop and collect the special fungi that their mother used to make that gall. And they'll put that fungus into their pockets and they'll actually carry around with them for the rest of their lives and use it to make more galls. And after those young, gall, after those young wasps, excuse me, emerge from that gall and continue their adult lives, a wide variety of other beneficial insects like ants, beetles, uh, flies and others actually reuse those galls. It's almost like an insect hostel. Uh, so it's great to just leave these on your plants um, and let really all kinds of wildlife reuse them while they're there. And now, um, interestingly enough, wasps have been found to be pretty intelligent. Social wasps have had a lot of research done on them. They've actually been found to be able to recognize their nest mates based on their faces and actually they can smell the very unique chemical coatings that each wasp has. And it seems that each nest actually has a different chemical coating on the outside of their body. And so they actually smell each other and they can identify each other by sight and smell. Also, um, uh, wasps have been used, have been found to be able to use tools. There are actually some species of hunting wasp that make uh, nests in the ground. And those wasps are actually known to pick up pebbles of the exact size of the entrance to their house. And they will actually use those pebbles to disguise the entrance to their nest, which is very impressive for an insect with a brain maybe 30,000 times smaller than ours. And interestingly enough, there was just a, a study done that showed that wasps also actually um, show a form of logic. Um, this study actually found that wasps, especially social wasps, will watch other wasps fight and if they watch a, a wasp win a fight, that wasp will not pick a fight with that winning wasp, um, which shows that again, they're able to learn from experiences and there is some kind of thought process going on in those tiny brains. Now, this picture does show one of the critical shortcomings of wasps as pollinators, and that is their really short tongues. Because they're mostly predators, wasps haven't evolved long or intricate tongues. And so they really require very shallow, easily accessible blooms to feed on during the day when they need nectar. And so um, they really prefer compound flowers like here, this angelica in the carrot family. They also really love sunflowers and goldenrod, um, basically any flower that's actually a group of tiny shallow flowers is excellent for wasps and other short-tongued pollinators. We'll get into some other short-tongued pollinators in just a bit. Um, but again, a great way to attract these adult wasps to your garden is to have a good number of these compound, shallow, easily accessible flowers. And now let's move on to moths. Now, I would call moths probably the most underappreciated pollinator there is. Now, interestingly enough, while mo moths are mostly active at night, they're also extremely important pollinators for a lot of our cold blooming plants, like say witch hazel, which sometimes blooms in the middle of winter. And many times moths are some of the only insects that are able to actually warm themselves up and fly in those cold conditions. And so even though a lot of this happens at night, Moths are some of our true pollinator juggernauts, especially, of course, for our night blooming plants. Now, it might not seem like it to you, but there are actually about 11 times more species of moths in the US than there are butterflies. So there are basically moths everywhere in every ecosystem all around us performing critical services that we really don't notice. And more so than most other pollinators, it's very important to plant specific native plants for your favorite native moths, because just like butterflies, a lot of moths use native plants and the chemicals that are incorporated in those native plants to give their larva a leg up. Most caterpillars, for example, actually incorporate chemicals from the plants that they eat into their own bodies to make themselves either unpalatable or outright poisonous to other predators. And so, you wanna keep native plants growing wherever and whenever possible. Now, 
some of the greatest actually um, supporters of native moths and butterflies are poison ivy and, and Virginia creeper, excuse me. Now, both of these are very effective wildlife plants. Unfortunately, as most of us know, humans have developed a, a pretty severe reaction to the urushiol or the oil in poison ivy. I've actually read that only a few drops of that oil would be enough to make the entire human population itch. It's that popular. But even though we can't usually get too close to it, it's excellent habitat for a wide variety of, of animals. And so try to leave your poison ivy wherever possible. And just really quickly, let's go over the similarities between poison ivy and another great creeping vine, Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper offers habitat and forage for a wide variety of beneficial insects. And they both look very similar, especially in their young form. Um, in its young form, you can see that the Virginia creeper on the right, as it grows older, it does tend to have five leaves. But when it's young, it does sometimes have three leaves with very similar uh, indentations in the leaves and sometimes similar colorations to poison ivy. And so if you're thinking about whether or not you want to uh, pull a vine that you think is poison ivy and it's early in the season, I recommend you wait, give it some time to mature and make sure it's not a Virginia creeper. Because the other difference in Virginia creeper is it turns this beautiful red in the fall. And so it can make beautiful sweeps either on a slope or growing up a tree. Uh, and in the fall, it makes this beautiful red color that can really accent um, some of your other winter interests. Um, and you never have to worry generally about poison ivy or Virginia creeper killing any of your plants. The good thing about a lot of our native vines is a lot of them are dainty enough that even if they do uh, get a hold of a tree and really colonize it very heavily, they very rarely grow to such extremes that they'll actually harm that tree. Um, unless the tree was, you know, already struggling to begin with. And so you don't have to worry about either of these plants, you know, destroying trees, but they're excellent, excellent native plants for moths, especially. And now, some of the other natives that are excellent for moths are some of the more aromatic plants. Um, so let's say tulip poplar, sassafras, sassafras, excuse me, and spice bush. Um, a lot of those plants that if you scrape them or pick off a leaf, and you get an aromatic smell, a lot of our native moths actually incorporate those chemicals, again, into their young um, to make them either less palatable or dangerous to predators. Um, here's another one of our attractive native moths. And I just wanted to note that um, it might seem second nature to some people, but do not pet the fuzzy caterpillars. Uh, they all basically have fiberglass-like spines on them that will break off and some of them are actually um, equipped with toxins as well. So they're pretty potent. So do not touch, even though they look like they'd appreciate a good scratch. Uh, trust me, they do not. Now, one of the most um, readily recognized moth larvae in the garden are horn hornworms. And now hornworms, of course, get their name from that long red, or this one's red, the long protuberance off of their rear end, that long horn. Um, and these are generally huge caterpillars, some of the biggest caterpillars you'll see in a garden. So most gardeners tend to freak out at the first sight of these animals and generally tend to eradicate them when they see them. Now, um, these hornworms are actually fascinating and uh, most of them turn into very important um, moths active both in the daytime and in the nighttime. Um, interestingly enough, these have some of the coolest, in my opinion, um, natural pest deterrents, a lot of these hornworms will actually spew poison gas when a predator comes near them. Uh, for example, the tobacco hornworm uh, exudes a cloud of nicotine around itself when it senses danger. So a lot of these um, animals are, are very easy to, or very able to uh, ward off predators on their own. Um, however, they do have a voracious appetite and they will take large chunks of, out of your plants. And so, even though I do recommend you leave these wherever you find them, what we like to do, like especially in this case, if say you have some tomato hornworms devouring your tomatoes, we generally like to leave a sacrificial plant. So one tomato plant that we leave to the worms and that we kind of pick off, pick the worms off of the other ones and put them on the sacrificial plant, let them have their fill on that tomato plant. That way you can have, uh, you can have your worms and they can eat it too, basically. 
Um, and that will kind of give uh, your garden um, plenty of beneficial pollinators. Um, and once you remove those uh, caterpillars from your prized plants, you can net them uh, for a couple weeks until the, that life cycle is complete and you shouldn't have any damage on your other plants. And now as we're talking about hornworms, we should talk about hummingbird moths because actually some hornworms turn into these moths which are actually some of the coolest looking daytime pollinators. Now, there are multiple types of hummingbird moths. Some of them mimic the colorations of hummingbirds. Some of them look more like a bumblebee, but they all mimic larger creatures that are able to put up a fight against predators. And we'll see later, especially when we talk about flies, a lot of our important pollinators mimic the colorations of other more dangerous animals to protect themselves from predators. And now, the, you can see the long, luxurious tongue that this hummingbird moth has. And so one excellent uh, bonus for moths is that most of them have, like butterflies and bees, very long proboscis that they can actually use to drink nectar from a wide variety of flowers. So as long as you have the host plants that that specific species needs to raise their young on, as far as floral resources go, moss can access actually a wide range of flowers. So you don't have to be as careful as say with moths. Uh, you can plant a wide variety of flowers and you can really be sure that they'll feed on almost anything you plant. We've found that hummingbird moths like these really prefer flocks and liatris, uh, mostly a lot of the, as you see here, pink and purple flowers uh, that are blooming in kind of late spring into midsummer. <clears throat> and now, Interestingly enough, these hummingbird moths are one of the very few creatures that can, hum that can hover in nature. I believe there's only four species of animals that can hover and they can fly extremely fast. They're some of the fastest insects. I think they've been clocked at going about 30 miles per hour. And so these attractive animals, they're hard to spot, but once you spot them, especially if you've got a, a dense patch of, of pink or purple flowers, uh, once you see these, you'll never be able to miss them again. They're, they're very attractive. And again, some of our only day uh, or diurnal um, moths. Now, here's another picture of a common sphinx moth in the area. Again, all of these moths generally have only a handful of plants that they raise their young on. And all of these plants are native plants. And so it's just another great reason to plant as many native plants and the biggest variety of native plants as possible just to give all of these animals the exact plants that they need, just to, to live and survive and grow young uh, as they live in your area. And so moving on from moths, let's take a look at the beetles in and around your area. Now, beetles are actually believed to have emerged about 300 million years ago. They're some of the oldest insects. And that was actually at a time when most of the global coal deposits we're still green growing plants waiting to be subducted under the crust. Beetles are that old. Beetles have actually survived multiple mass extinctions, including one that wiped out almost all of the life on earth. I believe it was 90% of life on land or 90% of life in the ocean and about 75% of the life on land, excuse me. Now, because beetles have been around for so long and because um, basically they've evolved to fill every niche in the environment, you're gonna find beetles basically everywhere you look once you start looking in the garden. Now, early pollinators like this green jewel beetle, again, just like wasps, have very short tongues and they're very clumsy, uh, haphazard flyers. And so for these beetle pollinators, just like wasps, as you can see in the picture, they really prefer flowers with very large bullseye landing pads, like say a big collection of these compound shallow flowers or larger flowers that are easy to see and land on, like say a magnolia flower, which actually magnolia flowers are thought to look very similar to how some of the very first flowers uh, appeared, uh, again, hundreds of millions of years ago. And so uh, beetles are very attracted to large, easily seen, and easily attracted um, flowers and blooms as they're pollinating, but not every beetle only pollinates. In fact, the weevils, which is actually the largest beetle family, uh, they do almost everything. You'll find beetles uh, from the pantry all the way to the pollinator garden. 
Actually, weevils were thought to have been some of the first or the first fungus farmers in existence. And it's thought that ants actually took up fungus farming about 40 million years after these weevil beetles. Um, and so these weevils, actually the family is so large that it includes more members than all wasps, bees, and butterflies combined. It's a humongous family. <clears throat> and you'll see these weevils uh, walking in and around your garden, feeding on pollen, and actually they feed on fungus uh, and dead wood. They actually, there's types of weevils that basically feed on everything. But just like the other uh, beetles, those large, easily seen compound flowers are the most attractive for them if they ever want a drink of nectar. Now, there's about 400,000 species of beetles. <clears throat> It's the largest group that we know of. They make up about 40% of insects known to science today. And that's why you see every beetle almost looks radically different. And they all almost perform radically different services in the environment. These Hercules beetles, for example, primarily feed on dead and rotting wood. And actually the vast majority of beetle larvae <clears throat> burrow through dead and rotting wood and they help break it down and actually their tunnels that they bore into dead wood are reused by a wide variety of solitary wasps and bees and other insects. So they're critically important to an environment. But these Hercules beetles are actually one of the largest flying insects known to science. <clears throat> and they're actually protected like all beetles are and most insects by a thick coat of chitin which is actually a, a material that's synthesized in their bodies. It's, it's formed by a derivative of glucose, excuse me. And actually an example of chitin strength was just found in a research done on the ironclad beetle, which is mostly found on the west coast of America, but actually it's chitin, it's armored shell is so strong that it can withstand forces almost 40,000 times its body weight without being crushed. It's similar to something like over 20 blue whales on a human, I think is what the article stated. Now, chitin has protected countless organisms throughout Earth, but another uh, fascinating aspect of chitin is that scientists actually think that it could actually be used to build off-world structures on, say, Mars or other planets. So as humanity kind of moves from the Earth onto other planets, um, and if we're using insects as a protein source, which is actually one of the most efficient protein sources uh, there is known. Uh, a byproduct would be a lot of this chitin. And actually, it's so strong, light, and manipula uh, easily manipulated that it can easily be built into um, incredible structures. So you know, I think we'll, we'll be bringing these beetles along with us also as we venture out into space. And they'll, they'll be performing these important services even off, the, even off world. And now, <clears throat> in case you couldn't guess, just as varied as beetles are, their habitats are incredibly varied as well. But it's all very easy to maintain. The, one of the most critical things, as I mentioned with the Hercules beetle, is try to leave dead, dying, and rotting wood around and on your property wherever possible. This will attract a huge amount of beetles who will both raise their young and break down that wood into soil so it can actually go back uh, into your garden and actually benefit uh, the plants and animals as they grow. Now, um, excuse me, this tiger beetle is actually a predatory beetle. And so there's actually huge uh, families or groups of beetles that uh, only hunt other animals. And so a lot of these beetles, even though they can fly for short distances, a lot of them will actually run along the ground super fast, basically snatching anything up that they come into contact with. And so these be beetles are great pest control as well. And these beetles, while they do appreciate certainly dead and dying wood, a lot of these predatory beetles really seem to prefer nesting at the base of really uh, dense tufts of grass. And so think switchgrass or muley grass, any kind of dense clumping grass really seems to be preferable for these insects to really settle down. And so put some of those grasses, um, you know, towards the periphery or corners of your, of your garden to try and give these animals a place to settle down. 
And now let's come to certainly the flashiest of all beetles, the firefly. And now fireflies are secondary pollinators like most other beetles. They do feed on a pollen and nectar from flowers, but these beetles do live underground for up to two or three years before they emerge in their final uh, firefly form. And so for fireflies and a lot of other beetles, it's very important that you stay vigilant as to what you put into your soil, especially as far as pesticides go. Because these, um, as young fireflies are burrowing through your soil, aerating it and hunting uh, pests like slugs and other things, um, they are heavily impacted by pesticide exposure. And so try to limit what you put into your soils for these and other beetles. So now let's take a quick look at flies. Now, flies, while of course they don't have the many branched hairs that bees do, there are believed to be so many flies visiting the flowers in and around your garden that they're thought to actually be number two in importance of pollination to bees themselves. Uh, flies, just like wasps, a lot of times in their younger forms, they might feed on a variety of different living or dead things. In their adult form, they do use nectar as an energy source from flowers. And so they are constantly visiting flowers and they're constantly pollinating as they do so. And the other important benefit is cirphid flies like these uh, actually perform incredible pest control services as they're young and growing as well. So what a lot of these flies will do is they'll fly around a garden. They're actually able to smell certain chemicals that aphid colonies give off as they suck the sap from your plants. Now, what these cirphid flies will do is they'll actually land right next to that aphid colony and lay a bunch of eggs. Those eggs will hatch and those young flies will actually feast on that aphid colony and actually wipe most of it out just through those young flies alone. And so these uh, cirphid flies and <clears throat> the similar bee fly on the bottom left, they have kind of a double whammy effect on your garden, wherein they'll pollinate your plants and perform pretty great pest control at the same time. And now ants are probably the last critically important pollinator that don't get enough credit, I would say. Now there's about 800 species of ants in the US. However, most ants are very, very difficult to identify, especially just from a gardener's perspective being several feet away. So don't stress too much about identifying the ants in your gardens, but uh, be, um, I guess, well, I'll just, ants are really the, the social butterflies of the insect kingdom. Uh, even though there are some animals like these social wasps that I talked about earlier that live together and cooperate, they're mostly the minority. Ants, on the other hand, are only known to be social to science. And so there are some ants that live together in one single colony. There are ants that live only in small sections of other ant colonies. There are even ant colonies that have humongous networks of tunnels under the ground that are like tens of miles along that form super colonies of billions of individuals. So ants have really taken over the world in a lot of ways. It's believed that ants probably make up most of the, um, the biomass in the world. Basically there are more ants, it's believed, than almost anything else in the world, uh, when, except when you're talking about you know, microbes and tiny, tiny organisms. Now, most ants, they do pollinate plants, but ants are also critical seed dispersers. It's thought that they uh, um, disperse about half of all plant seeds. And actually some plants create seeds that have little structures on them called eliasomes that actually are tasty to the ant. And the ant will grab onto that, bring the seed back to its nest. They will take that tasty bit off of the seed and discard the seed in their refuse pile basically planting it and, and then that plant will grow actually from that ant's refuse pile. So they're incredibly important seed dispersers as well as pollinators. And then this is another common site in and around the garden. It's actually when ants will um, herd together groups of aphids and that's um, not actually because they like the look of aphids. It's actually to get after the sugary honeydew that those aphids secrete as they suck sap out of your plants. And so um, if you do see a lot of 
grouped up aphids um, being patrolled by ants. It's not by accident. Those ants are actually farming those aphids. They will protect them from other predators. And actually ants have been found to poke those aphids with their antennae to encourage them to secrete more honeydew that those ants then use as a food. It's, it's basically like a sugar syrup, almost like a nectar type of thing. And now I would like to remind you that these insects have brains about 40,000 times smaller than ours. And so it's remarkable and science is still kind of clueless in some of the ways that these animals are able to function the way that they do. Now, as we mentioned earlier, leaving an area of the yard wild like this is incredibly beneficial to animals, especially beneficial insects. This is a section of our front yard that we just let go. And basically uh, I, I removed um, probably two rounds of invasive species. And after that, the only things that came up were these frost aster, blue asters uh, and goldenrod. And so these were all uh, plants that were uh, lying dormant in the seed bank for probably up to five years, waiting their turn to emerge. And as soon as I stopped mowing, they took their chance and recolonized the area. And interestingly enough, um, studies have found that in an ecosystem like this, as the, the diversity of plants increases, the energy efficiency of the entire ecosystem also increases in tune. And so basically, just by increasing the diversity of plantings in and around your property, you can increase the efficiency of the entire ecosystem. And now this brings me to pesticides, which have been under, of course, increased scrutiny in recent years. But studies are showing that all pesticides, even seemingly benign pesticides like herbicides and fungicides, can actually combine together in the bodies of pollinators and other beneficial insects. And once they're inside that animal, they can actually uh, interact with other um, insecticides and pesticides that that animal has come into contact with. And they can actually turn into more harmful forms. And even if that insect escapes that exposure without dying, which is known as a sublethal exposure, studies are finding that actually the brains of these insects are becoming damaged just by being in contact with a lot of these pesticides. And so what that means is some of these pollinators are forgetting skills that they've learned throughout their lives and their forage capability and capability to form nests and survive the winter time are heavily impacted by pesticide exposure. And so again, one of the best things you can do for these animals is to really limit the use of your pesticides. It's really time we started using pesticides as a last resort rather than a first choice. And I do know, speaking to such um, illustrious garden clubs as you, I know you do know this already, but this is a message that can bear to be repeated um, as many times as needed until um, our spray and forget culture is really put by the wayside. And now, as I mentioned earlier, leaves are incredibly important. So you want to leave, again, about two inches of leaves somewhere on your property to give the animals uh, in and around your area, especially somewhere to settle down over the winter time. And so, you know, try to resist um, carting your leaves away. You can still pile them up and jump in them for a couple times. Um, but then again, I encourage you to put them uh, to the peripheries of your property um, rather than cart them away or burn them. And now the last important thing I want to mention is cultivars. And now, even though planting native plants is by and above one of the best things you can do to support local wildlife, unfortunately, not every native plant is created equal. And now what I'm talking about are cultivated varieties, shortened usually into cultivars and sometimes native ours, which are native cultivated varieties. And now there are all kinds of cultivars in the plant industry. Most of them are plants that have been bred by illustrious growers and they have been bred to perform certain things. So some cultivars have different foliage colors like these two different types of heuchera. Some plants um, are cultivars that are uh, better um, at surviving drought or disease. However, there are some cultivars that you want to avoid when you're planting for wildlife. One of those, like we see here, are cultivars that heavily change the foliage color of a plant to a large degree. So I used heuchera or coral bells here as an example. 
because there's like thousands of different types of, of heuchera that all have varying types of colors. And as we all know, those colors in the leaves actually come from different chemicals that that plant is pumping throughout its whole. And a lot of those chemicals were originally developed by the plant to ward off or damage any potential um, munchers that might be trying to eat that plant. And so unfortunately, when a native plant um, is turned into a cultivar that has its foliage heavily altered, unfortunately, that means that that native plant now has a huge amount of new or foreign chemicals pumping through its body that it normally wouldn't. And so what that means is that sometimes uh, if a native uh, beneficial insect or other uh, animal comes by and tries to feed off of that plant, it will come into contact with chemicals that it hasn't evolved the capacity to deal with. And so it can actually become dangerous to those creatures if um, you know, those, those chemicals are actually poisonous to them. And so I would avoid planting any cultivars that have um, uh, manipulated the foliage color to any large degree. And when you go, of course, to a, a nursery, um, you can ask the growers there, hey, is this a cultivar or is this a straight species? And if it's a cultivar, you know, what is it, what is it manipulating? And again, if it's manipulating the foliage to any huge degree, I would drop it like it's hot. The other cultivar to avoid is the double blooms. And now we've probably all come into contact with double bloom varieties. What that is, is as you can see on the right here, it's actually um, a flower that seems to have uh, you know, twice as many petals as normal. It's also almost bursting at the seam with petals. While it looks great to our eyes, that cultivar is actually the result of a mutation of the reproductive structures of the flower itself. And so actually, a lot of the pollen and nectar is either non-existent or simply inaccessible to any insects or other animals that try to visit um, to feed off of that flower. And so um, uh, the other cultivar to really uh, avoid is any cultivar that changes the bloom shape to any large degree. And again, the double bloom type uh, is, is the most offensive uh, type of cultivar that does this. And you can easily see um, between these two, there's um, really no comparison between the accessibility between the plant on the right, uh, left and on the plant on the right. Um, and so again, try to avoid any native cultivars that alter the foliage or the bloom type to any large degree. Other than that, most, most other cultivars are relatively benign and most of them will give a, a plant a better chance of surviving, um, especially in heavily disturbed spots. Um, and so most of them are good. You just want to avoid those, those two uh, most of the time. Now, again, I just want to stress the importance of clumping tall grasses for habitat, especially for beetles. And actually a lot of bumblebees make their nests at the base of grass tufts like this. So try to have at least a few of these tall, tumping, cl tall clumping grasses somewhere on your property. And with these grasses and with all of your plants, you wanna plant your plants in groups of at least three. So they kind of form together a large, easily seen and easily smelled mass rather than polka dotting plants throughout your landscape, which makes them a little bit um, harder to see for any pollinators or other animals that are passing through. And the last thing is trees are gonna be a very important source for food uh, and habitat for a lot of the um, pollinators and other beneficial insects in your area. So when you're planning and designing your, um, your gardens, take a walk around your, your neighborhood or your, your uh, nearby area and take note, especially of all the trees that are already growing in your area. And take note about when those plants and other trees are gonna be blooming and when you're designing your garden, try to have plants that fill the gaps in bloom times of the plants that are already in bloom and around your area. And that way you can keep your whole area as attractive as possible for as long as possible for as many uh, insects uh, really that are coming through looking for a place to settle down and raise their young. And so um, again, the last thing with trees is just if you have a dead standing tree and if it's possible, try to just leave it where it is for as long as possible. Um, the even one dead standing tree can be a house uh, for tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of insects um, in even a few years. And so again, just try to leave uh, your, your habitats really as natural as they are 
try not to remove detritus or dead trees um, as you find them. And so um, thank you everyone for coming by today. I hope you learned um, a little bit about some of these underappreciated pollinators. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them uh, either today or you can send me an email at that email down below. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, we have a few questions that came up through the presentation. So okay. I'll go ahead and address those first. Um, the first was a question about the poison ivy and making sure that when you're differentiating poison ivy from Virginia creeper or any other wild vine, um, does it always have red stems? And is that always a dead giveaway? Um, my short answer would be no. Um, you know, leaves of three is, is, is a better option, but I'll let you take it from here. Yep, you're right. Um, luckily, when it's young and it's just emerging, poison ivy tends to be very glossy and it does tend to be more red than later in the season. So if you're catching it, you know, as it's just sprouting, it does tend to be red. But as you can see on the right, Virginia creeper is red sometimes as well. And I've even seen some native clematis vines that also have a tinge of red to them as well. Um, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, um, you know, there's no um, easy way. It's just um, try to identify them as early in the season as possible. And it'll probably be easier to recognize that super glossy leaf and that red stem um, mm -hmm. more so than the Virginia creeper, which the Virginia creeper tends to turn red the longer into the season it is. Okay, good. Um, with regard to, um, you had mentioned netting the, the larva and the moths for about three weeks. Do you want to expand on that? Uh, yes, so you'll, you want just a, a fine mesh netting, a, a fine mesh netting, excuse me. Um, and what I like to do is I like to net plants and then leave an opening at the base of a plant of maybe three or four inches, nothing too high, but high enough that any snakes or any other creatures that were creeping along in your garden wouldn't get stuck in that netting. But basically what you wanna do is you're just covering that plant for the few weeks or month or so that moths are around looking for those plants to lay their eggs on. And something I should say, cause I saw the full question in there, Something to remember is that we're leaving one of those plants, at least one, if not more, open, completely open. Right. And that's the one that we're using as our sacrificial plant. And we're taking any of the caterpillars that somehow have gotten their way up into the netted plants, we move them over to those other plants. That's usually our method. Right. So it's always about kind of constricting some of the plants to make them less desirable. And usually pollinators and any other creature who's looking for something is going to go for the easy route. And so that's usually our best way to do it. And we, like Brandon said, we usually only net it for the time that the caterpillars are really out there, but it's that combination of netting and sacrificial plants that usually allow us to keep the things we don't want being too heavily munched. Right, and even though, you know, hornworms especially, a lot of these caterpillars can really decimate a plant almost overnight, it's incredible how much pest pressure a lot of our plants can withstand. And so, you know, even one plant is enough to, to foster a, a huge amount of caterpillars for a year. And I'll bounce off of that. I know that in, in Charleston and mostly all the way up to the mid state, um, we can still have our um, coal crops growing right now, cabbage, collards, kale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one method that we use down here is we will use the, the white light row covers and use those for the edible portion of the crops. And then we'll keep other um, varieties of those same plants in our pollinator beds to be decimated. Awesome. And then that way you have that sacrificial mm -hmm. um, and you have that concentration where it counts the most. Definitely. And, and you know, it's always a fine line between, you know, halting pest damage and allowing pollinators and other animals, you know, access to those plants. Um, but again, um, it's usually only a few weeks or so that we require to kind of net them up and then we mm -hmm. take it right off. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna open it up to the audience and if you would kindly unmute yourself if you have a question. <clears throat> oh, I hear a question coming. Linda? 
No, no, no. I, I, I thought this was very, very interesting. Um, and and I have a new respect for Virginia Creepa and indeed even poor than Ivy. But but um, no, I I I don't really have a, uh, another question. I I was just clearing my throat. Thank you, though. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I'll pose a question because it's a question that we get a lot um, in the Garden for Life arena, and that is a lot of permaculturists recommend that you smother everything in cardboard. And I know that that is a huge controversy. So I just want your take on that policy. Yes, like I talked about with multiple insects, um, actually most of our bees um, and a lot of our wasps live in the ground. And so when you cover the ground with plastic or cardboard or newspaper or something to smother um, plants, while you are killing plants, you're also restricting access to the soil for a lot of those very important insects. And mm you know, any fireflies or beetle larvae that are waiting their turn to emerge the soil find it much harder to do so as well. And so <clears throat> I usually just tend to um, slowly transfer an area like that over to its natural state rather than all at once by kind of nuking the area. Um, I vastly prefer leaving the soil open for all those beneficial insects rather than kind of closing it off for a season or two. Um, and what I do again is the first pass is I'll go through, remove all the invasive plants. Usually that takes, you know, a couple seasons, maybe three seasons. And at that <laughs> same time, you'll see native plants start to come up on their own. And then you can kind of um, identify little, um, you know, communities of native plants that you then want to foster and or plant around. And I kind of make it more of a multi-season project rather than a you know, all at once project, I guess. A good example I would say is that um, recently um, we had a whole crop of Carolina lilies, uh, the beautiful kind of uh, burrowed over trump trumpet flowers. They're just incredible. They smell amazing. Uh, hummingbirds use them, all of them use them, but these Carolina lilies, we had never seen them before. We're on our third year of letting uh, this process that Brandon's talking about in our front yard, and we had them pop up all over the place. Um, and then we went down, we let the seeds kind of naturally dry. And then we took a lot of those seed pods and now planted them in a bunch of other places that we want to have them. And those are really very rare species. And again, they probably were sitting in our seed bank for years and didn't have the opportunity to come up. And if we would have smothered them with cardboard, we still would have halted that opportunity. So it really is a fine balance. And, and often we, if people really want to do that, we tell them maybe to only do that in a very specific location. Or, or do it piecemeal. So you're still leaving those other areas open and you're not just kind of canceling out your entire yard at right. one time. And you definitely wanna be especially careful, you know, putting anything on the soil like that, especially around trees, because, um, you know, cardboard or something on the soil will significantly affect how water can percolate down and could uh, damage or even kill trees, you know, if you completely cover the area around them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good information. Um, and one of the things that you were that you didn't address, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to address it right now, um, are is water in the garden, mm -hmm. and and using water in a way that um, you create significant and unique habitats. Do you want to just talk about that for a moment? Definitely. Um, unfortunately, you know, if you have a heavily disturbed site where a lot of the topsoil has been removed, the water's not really going to flow in a natural way or how it normally would, um, you know, originally. And so, yes, what we like to do is um, try to have an area of, of the property where we channel, you know, heavy water flows and let it kind of percolate and settle naturally uh, into a more native uh, spot. Um, and especially for uh, like a stream bed, it's always great to leave uh, as much of the stream bed undisturbed as possible. So, you know, only um, planting, you know, right on the side, not of course, in the stream or anything like that. And another important thing to keep in mind is if you have a, a relatively dry property where you don't have much water, an option to still give water to a lot of the pollinators and other beneficial insects are plants that actually have little water collecting reservoirs in them that can then, um, you know, hold on to water and uh, give, give animals the, the, the hydration that they need. <clears throat> so um, some natives, like say a cup plant, um, you know, depending on where you live, if, if you're 
far south enough, maybe some bromeliads or types of plants that have those natural um, cups or reservoirs for water are a great, great way to kind of bring water into your garden, especially in like a dry space. And same with, with bird baths or with uh, koi ponds or something like that. If you're gonna have a water feature, just make sure you put um, a lot of shallow stone uh, places where um, all of our bees, our butterflies, anything where they land, they actually have a place to put their feet. If it's just a big koi pond and they don't have actually some stones that are kind of slightly hung out of the water that they can sit on and then drink in, it makes it really difficult. And most of our native pollinators, I mean, they're not like honeybees. They can't travel miles and miles to get what they need. They get what they need within 100 to 200 yards of right around where they live. So if they don't find food, water, shelter, uh, everything they need and those very sometimes specific predators and preys and habitats they just cannot survive and that's one of the reasons why our native insects um are just really kind of falling by the wayside i mean we've lost so many of them and it's due mainly to habitat loss right yeah like jill said uh, bird bass are great um but you don't have to worry about having like pristine water sources in and around your garden um Interestingly enough, a lot of bees and butterflies seem to prefer brackish or really dirty water. I think they get certain nutrients um, from the mud and other things in, you know, dirty water. And so even just a, a space in your garden that retains a little bit of water and stays moist um, would be good enough for a wide variety of beneficial insects. If you've ever seen butterflies, they call it puddling, where they're all kind of come together at a puddle, like Brandon said. Um, pretty much any type of water that you have or those dead standing trees, a lot of dead standing trees have holes and reservoirs within the trees that gather water. So again, it's just, if, if you're not gonna be able to put it in man-made, if you leave your wild spaces, it should be able to do what you need it to do for you. Okay, other than the um, letting nature take its course and repopulate by just removing the invasives, what do you recommend in your area or for the rest of the South Carolina gardeners who are looking for good sources to help restore the native, art, the native um, habitats in their own yard? Generally, in my experience, the most limiting factor for what plants you can find is simply what people around you are able to grow. And so what I definitely recommend is go to your local nurseries, especially your, your local native plant nurseries, and ask them, you know, what they grow, what they, you know, have noticed does really well in the area, more importantly, maybe what does not do well in the area, and then use their suggestions to then, you know, populate your plantings. And again, um, you definitely want to have something that's in bloom in spring, something in, in summer, and something in fall. Um, and again, you do want to avoid some of those cultivars we talked about, but in general, just planting the widest variety of native plants that you can is really the best way to go. And something we found is it's really important, Brandon's mentioned this a couple times, to get to know your property. So for us, we had a really huge um, lack of blooms in the late summer and late fall. We had tons of stuff from the trees, the rhododendrons, the azaleas, the mountain laurels, all of our neighbors, all of the beautiful summer blooming plants, the echinaceas, there was tons of stuff everywhere. But then we just saw this kind of lack of stuff in that late that late season. And that's where we really focused in on when we started seeing the yard getting colonized very heavily by those asters and those golden rods. We were really excited because those are the premier late season pollinator and wildlife forage. And so it was one of those things that when we started seeing them coming in, we would let them just keep con con ugh, colonizing in those spaces because we specifically wanted those plants. And we noticed that this year in uh, a few weeks in June, we have a very specific written down kind of dates and hoping we have similar bloom times where we just saw a lack of bloom on our property. And so now we're looking at some penstemon and some other things that will kind of fill that bloom gap that we're noticing. So I think that that's really important. You wanna see what you have and find out what you need to supplement. It's always great to have more, but you don't wanna put a bunch more spring blooming plants on your spring blooming yard and then realize that halfway throughout the season, you're not able to support uh, the wildlife that you were once able to have there. That's a great point. And I think that's one of the best um, options with garden clubs because each month we get together when we are able and we share the things that, that each of us have unique in our yards 
that can benefit other people. You know, we talked in the very beginning about um, this is the perfect time of year between say September and now to do some seed collecting. Mm -hmm. um, not only in your own garden, but along other um, wild areas, as long as you're respectful of not taking everything or decimating an area. Um, yeah. Do you want to speak for just a moment about how you collect seeds from your own areas? I know we all have our own methods, but yeah. you know, we do it under the cover of darkness sometimes, but <laughs> right, right. Do it. Like, like you uh, kind of hinted at, um, we first off try to let as many um, animals kind of benefit from the seeds as possible. So I honestly like to leave seed heads uh, and other seeds really uh, up, uncut, and in the garden, really for most, if not all, of the winter. And I actually harvest my seeds in the spring. Um, that way, you know, any birds or other animals that are passing through in need of a quick bite can, can munch on some of those seeds if they can. And as well, um, so that a lot of those seeds, if they require cold stratification, can get that naturally rather than, um, you know, having to bring them inside and put them in the fridge or, or some other way. Um, and so that is one thing I would, I would certainly encourage is, um, you know, let, leave the seeds for as long as possible just to benefit wildlife. And also for each seed, just quickly research, um, you know, how in nature it actually germinates. Um, like I said, with cold germination, some seeds require being frozen or very near frozen to germinate. And so if you do um, you know, harvest some of those seeds, you wanna make sure you put them in the right environment um, for the best success. Yeah, really the only thing we plant in the fall are ephemerals. So if there's any things like those, those lilies or the crocus or anything that we're gonna have coming up in the spring, that's really the only thing. Um, but often what we will do, um, so like right now our yard is just full of dead goldenrod and aster and echinacea, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Um, and uh, goldenrod is a great example, um, kind of in the early spring before things really start, when you really get into the ground again, and those animals have eaten as many of those seeds and used it as much as we can, you can actually just bury that entire head from the goldenrod right underneath the ground or anywhere you want to have it. And that's a surefire way of getting a really new strong plant uh, growing up every year. So that's something that we'll do often. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, so and, and we will do a little bit of the um, gorilla seed collecting uh, that you're talking about. Uh, often we do that a lot at the landscape uh, gardens that we put together for other people when we're <laughs> there for late season maintenance. Uh, one of the people this year got some uh, goat's beard that we had never had. And so we definitely took took a little bit of those seeds to bring home to plant. But like Brandon said, we we're all about letting nature do as much of what it can do on its own, let it do its thing. Often those seeds need to go through the digestive tract of a creature anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's one of those things where it's, it's that fine balance, but I think waiting until spring is always really, really helpful. And something too, then when you cut those seed pods down in spring, um, a lot of those plants that we're talking about have those kind of long pithy stems. Those then also become perfect location for different bees and other native insects that nest inside those stems to be easily able to get down into them. Yeah, so we like to trim our stems at least, you know, a foot high or so. Um, and then that following season, those pithy stems are usually reused by all kinds of, of beneficial insects. And yeah, like Jill said, um, that's a great point about, um, <clears throat> you know, goldenrod or joe pie weed or any, you know, dense tufts of seed, um, seed pods or seed heads. We like to just bury the whole head under maybe two inches of soil. And that works really well at helping, you know, germinate and growing a, a huge patch right there. What great advice. And I know that, um, Brandon, you, Brandon, you are a prolific writer and you have a book that you wanted to share with our audience. Did you want to bring that up? Sure. Yeah, yeah, let me. Because as, you know, as we're talking about native plants and pollinator gardening and all of the various things that we're dreaming about for next year, one of the things that we would love to do is a lot of reading and planning. And so this is a great opportunity to share your wisdom with our readers. Definitely. No, thank you. And yep, uh, my book, A Guide to the Wonderful World Around Us, Notes on Nature, it's a wide range of nature topics from the moon to uh, pollinator gardening and native bees. And so um, it's a book designed to be able to pick up, um, you know, be read for five to 10 minutes and you can learn 
you know, some fascinating aspects of a wide range of natural topics. And so um, I think it caters to, to really gardeners of all ages and experience ranges. Um, and yeah, a lot of uh, what I talked about uh, in this um, presentation today is included in parts in that book as well. Yeah, and you can get the, um, the books on our Etsy. It's also on Amazon, but we always like to try to support the, the small business websites before Amazon if we can. Um, right. But uh, we, it's on our Etsy. Uh, you can get the soft cover there. And there's also an ebook you can download if you are an audiobook listener, which I am. Um, you can download our audiobook, which we did. Um, yeah, you'll be listening to yeah. me, not Brannon. Uh, but uh, that is, we have it in all forms. Um, you can find that on Audible. Um, if, you, if you are the Amazon user, that is the one place we will direct you to for that. And like we said, we have um, a special code for anybody who's here today. If you want to get 15% off, we have our books uh, there. We also have our bee cabins. So if you need a, a native bee cabin uh, or you, you need some man-made housing, we sell these too. And we also do um, a digital landscape design service uh, that you can learn about on our Etsy. So a lot of stuff, um, but I, if you know any nature lovers in your family, whether they're pollinator lovers or mushroom lovers or any, any type of nature lover, um, Brandon's book is really a fantastic, fantastic gift. I'm not just saying that because I am his wife, um, <laughs> but he really is a fantastic writer and it's a great introduction into so many different nature topics and it's just a really fun read. Well, this has been extre extremely helpful and very, very um, in-depth for our audience. I'm sure that it'll be enjoyed many, many times over on our YouTube classroom. Um, I know that um, we have a lot of, we have a much larger audience than you have today that will be enjoying it. And I'm sure that you'll be hearing from them, um, ordering your book and asking questions. So we may just have you back. Before we close today, did anyone have any last minute questions or comments about today's program? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you again. This has been the Garden Club of South Carolina Classroom. Um, you can catch us on YouTube. There is a link on gardenclubofsc.org to our YouTube channel. And y'all have a great rest of the month. Hope you will learn a few things, incorporate some of the knowledge that you heard today. And particularly, I think my favorite takeaway is let nature take its own course in your yard. So thank you, Jill. Thank you, Brandon and everyone. Happy gardening. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. And Merry Christmas. You too. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody.